Greetings in our Savior's name. Uh, we come to Psalm number 17 and our study of the Psalms. And uh, I've been using uh, Luther's reading the Psalms and his prayers associated with each of the Psalms to open our Psalm studies for the last few times. And I think I would like to continue to do so. So the prayer he has uh, associated for Psalm 17 is how we begin our day. Lord Jesus, true shepherd and defender of your people, grant us wisdom, strength, and patience. Wisdom to know and to walk in the way of everlasting. Strength to resist all temptations of error and sin. And to boldly confess your truth before men. Patience to bear the cross without murmuring. And gladly, gladly to suffer with you that we may also rule with you. In Jesus' name, amen. We uh, begin as we do all of these psalm studies by reading the psalm section under consideration. And today we take the entirety of Psalm 17. Hear a just cause, O Lord, give heed to my cry. Give ear to my prayer, which is not from deceitful lips. Let my judgment come forth from your presence. Let your eyes look with equity. You have tried my heart. You have visited me by night. You have tested me and you find nothing. I have purposed that my mouth will not transgress. As for the deeds of men, by the word of your lips, I have kept from the paths of the violent. My steps have held fast to your paths. My feet have not slipped. I have called upon you, for you will answer me, O God. Incline your ear to me. Hear my speech. Wondrously show your loving kindness. O Savior of those who take refuge at your right hand, from those who rise up against them. Keep me as the apple of your eye. Hide me in the shadow of your wings. From the wicked who despoil me, my deadly enemies who surround me, they have closed their unfeeling heart. With their mouth they speak proudly. They have surrounded us in our steps. They have set their eyes to cast us down to the ground. He is like a lion that is eager to tear, and as a young lion lurking in hiding places. Arise, O Lord, confront him, bring him low. Deliver my soul from the wicked with your sword. From men with your hand, O Lord, from men of the world, whose portion is in this life, and whose belly you fill with your treasure, they are satisfied with children and leave their abundance to their babes. As for me, I shall behold your face in righteousness. I will be satisfied with your likeness when I awake. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Psalm 17, with like with many of the psalms, is an individual lament psalm with a cry for help. Interestingly, it begins with a series of reasons that the Lord should listen to the psalmist who states the, his case for being heard in verses 1 through 5. As distinct from the righteous path that he has followed, he clearly states why his enemy should receive no answer or help from God, and should in fact be made to bow down or be brought low, as we hear in verse 13. Historically, it's possible that this psalm was written by David when he is surrounded by Saul's troops in the desert of, of Maon. Um, you can read about that story in 1 Samuel 23, 24 to 28. We're not going to do so now, but you can look at that on your own. As we will see when we address verse 11, there is an emphasis on how David is encircled, and the Hebrew word is repeated in that verse. In Samuel 23, 26, we read this, For Saul and his men were surrounding David and his men to seize them. So it would be easy to set the psalm within that historical circumstance, although there really isn't enough information in the psalm to say for sure that that's a historical circumstance, but it certainly fits. Let's look at the outline. Um, the outline that I've given to you is composed of four parts. It's a psalm that is set up as a prayer. And the first part of the psalm is a prayer for God's vindication, verses 1 through 5. The second part is a prayer for God's intervention, verses 6 through 9. The third part is a prayer for God's deliverance from enemies, verses 10 through 14. And the fourth part is a prayer of assurance, verse 15 of Psalm 17. So let's begin with the first part, a prayer for God's vindication, Psalm 17, verses 1 through 5. In verse 1, the psalmist's righteousness serves as a bookend to the psalm. So he talks about his righteousness in verse 1, and he talks about his righteousness again in verse 15. Here in verse 1, his cause is righteous. Some translations will have his just cause, but his righteous cause, same thing. And then in verse 15, he can behold the Lord's face in righteousness. There at verse 15, you'll see 
that he's talking about what it'll be like when he awakes in eternal life and is able to behold the Lord's face, and he's able to do that in righteousness. So that word righteousness, the idea of the psalmist righteousness, bookends this, uh, the entire psalm. Additionally, that righteousness is defined primarily in terms of speech. We see in verse uh, 17, verse 1, not from deceitful lips, so the psalmist's lips are not deceitful. And then in verse 3, uh, my mouth will not transgress. We see righteousness defined in much the same way back in Psalm 15, if you recall, uh, verses 2 and 3, which says, And speaks truth in his heart, he does not slander with his tongue. It could very well be that because he is offering words in a prayer, he desires that God should know that they come from a righteous place. So he may wish to uphold his lips, his tongue, his mouth as righteous so that the prayer he offers comes from a righteous place. If we read James 3, verses 9 through 10, we find a similar idea. With the tongue, we praise our Lord and Father. With it, we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing, my brothers and sisters. This should not be. How does James' admonition line up with the psalmist's defense of his righteous tongue? Um, certainly, there's a connection here. Um, to the second and even the third commandments, the idea that we praise God and we praise him um, with our mouths, and therefore our mouths should also not be used for cursing, for swearing, be de being deceitful. Uh, David in Psalm 17 certainly seems to uphold that idea that he doesn't have deceitful lips, that he doesn't have a lying tongue, uh, that his mouth has not practiced deceit. And we say it again, see it again in James, that out of the same mouth should not come praising and cursing. And certainly, if you read the rest of James 3, you know uh, what a deadly fire uh, he calls the tongue. Um, and certainly, if you can keep your words in check, um, you're able to bridle, in James' words, your whole body. Uh, so the idea here being that uh, uh, the psalmist is offering up one, his farce part of his vindication is his mouth is righteous because he does not lie and he does not have deceitful speech. Verse 2, David seems supremely confident in his righteousness, for he invites God to judge him. Wow, that's pretty bold, isn't it? He even tells God to look at him with integrity. Some translations will have equity. Look at me with equity. But the idea here is integrity. Uh, judge me justly and appropriately. The implication is that God will not find anything wrong in him. We find Job making a similar defense of himself uh, in the book of Job, uh, chapter 27. As surely as God lives, who has denied me justice, the Almighty who has made my life bitter, as long as I have life within me, the breath of God in my nostrils, my lips will not say anything wicked, my tongue will not utter lies. I will never admit you are in the right. Till I die, I will not deny my integrity. There you go, there's that word. I will maintain my innocence and never let go of it. My conscience will not reproach me as long as I live. How does Job make kind of the same argument as David? It's really a self-defense argument. It is, isn't it? it? It's a call to, hey, look at my life. Look at what I've done. Look at what I have said and not said. If you look at those things, you'll realize that I've been in the right. I have been righteous. Job makes the same argument to his friends uh, gathered around the fire there as they come to comfort him when he had lost so much. And he says that God is punishing him unjustly. Now, later on in Job, uh, God takes Job to task for that and says, who do you think you are? Uh, here in the Psalm 17, uh, David makes a defense of his integrity, of his righteousness based on his speech. There is, however, following up with the next question, what is the danger of relying upon our righteousness to appeal to God? What's the danger of, of touting your, your righteousness? The truth is, and, and the answer to that is, that none of us are completely righteous. None of us are holy. None of us um, have the ability to stand before God on our own merits, no matter how good we think we are, no matter how good even we appear to be. Ultimately, uh, God must make uh, the decision and, and render the ju judgment, and his judgment of us will be that indeed all have fallen short of the glory. Oh, fallen short of the glory of God and have sinned. Excuse me. All right, well, let's go on to verse 3. David continues his defense of his righteousness so that he will be vindicated by God. Uh, he points out that God has tried his heart, has visited him by night, and even tested him. These three claims, clauses, excuse me, run parallel to one another and emphasize for David that he has indeed been scrutinized by God 
and finds uh, nothing to hold against him. Tested him is the Hebrew word for refine, and it's used in a similar way in Zechariah uh, 13, verse 9. This third I will put into the fire. I will refine them like silver and test them like gold. They will call on my name and I will answer them. I will say they are my people and they will say the Lord is our God. So Zechariah expressed that same idea that, that God will test people. Uh, he will refine them through that testing. Additionally to what God has already seen of David's righteousness, David also almost makes a promise at the end of verse 3 that he would continue to keep his mouth in check. Uh, can we win God's favor by the demonstration of a righteous life or the promise of one? Uh, certainly, we want to live lives that are God-pleasing. We want to follow as closely as possible God's word and the way it would call us to live our lives. But none of us should be pointing at our lives and saying, Look, God, you have to be pleased with me because I'm living like this. Because what usually happens is it comes as a comparison, right? Look at how well I'm living compared to those people over there. Look how terrible they're being. Look what they're doing compared to what I'm not doing. Uh, and so we end up doing this comparison thing. But the only comparison that really counts eternally is the comparison that we have to what God expects of us. And that comparison always causes us to look at ourselves and fall short and realize that we have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Verses 4 and 5. David now turns his attention to what temptations he has faced in those around him. Others had committed violent acts and pursued violent paths, but David had kept his feet on the paths of the Lord. He even indicates at the beginning of the verse that it is God who is saying of David that David has kept himself from violent ways by the word of your lips. So he's saying, look, Lord, you even have said that I've been a, a good guy, that I've been righteous and well-behaved, as it were. We are told that Christ will make a confession of us. That is, by his lips we will be indicated. Uh, Matthew 10, verses 32 and 33 tells us, Whoever acknowledges me before others, I will also acknowledge before my Father in heaven. Whoever disowns me before others, I will disown before my Father in heaven. So when will Christ acknowledge us? Uh, when we die and, and go to heaven or uh, when he returns, he will acknowledge us if we confess his name and confess it boldly. If we do not confess Christ, if we hesitate to confess Christ, if we withhold confession of Christ, he will also deny us. I wish I could say that more nicely, but that's simply the way Matthew 10 reads. Well, let's go to the next section then. So verses 1 through 5, uh, for God's vindication really of David, that his life has been righteous, right? That's what he's praying for. Lord, Lord look at me and, and declare me righteous. Now, He's going to go on in the next section is for God's intervention. So now he's really starting kind of the petition part uh, of this prayer in Psalm 17 that he's he set himself up and said, here's why, here's why I can ask. And now here's what I will ask. OK, verse six. Now that David had made his case, he will call upon God to act. Notice how he emphasizes hear my speech here in verse six. After he had just vindicated himself in the way he used his mouth and tongues and lips earlier. He is asking God to hear and act upon these words of prayer because his words are righteous. Once again, calling God almost as a witness. You have heard my speech. You have heard what I've said. Now hear these words of mine as I ask you to act. Verse 7, this verse demonstrates David's faith that God can and will act. And we're given that in a few different ways. The first way um, that David's faith is demonstrated is he demonstrates that God will act wondrously. And uh, we see that also in Genesis 18. Is anything too hard for the Lord? I will return to you at the appointed time next year, and Sarah will have a son. So this idea wondrously that God will act. David already knows that in the history of God's dealings with his people, he has acted miraculously, wondrously. He brought Noah through the flood, right? He brought the people of Israel out of Egypt miraculously through those plagues. And he delivered back in Genesis there. Uh, a son to Abraham and Sarah, even in their old age. So God has acted wondrously and miraculously, and that's really what he's beginning uh, this prayer with. Wondrously act on my behalf, O Lord. Uh, the second thing is uh, that God will, in that wondrous acting, demonstrate his, I think in the English it says loving kindness, but the Hebrew is really an important word here. The word is has said. This is the foundational word for Yahweh's relationship uh, with uh, his covenant relationship with Israel. In the New Testament, the equivalent to has said in the Hebrew is agape. And that, of course, is the Greek word for selfless love, absolute love. Uh, and so it would be hard to overemphasize the importance 
of both hesed, loving kindness, and agape, uh, God's selfless love, and uh, to deal with the faith life of God's people. It defines uh, God's relationship to his people, his mercy, his loving kindness, his grace, his agape to them, his hesed. The third thing we find here that demonstrates um, David's faith in these verses is that he addresses God as Savior. While this word is rightly translated as a noun in the English, and you see that in your English translations, he's called Savior. In the Hebrew, it appears as a participle, and that would be the saving one. You hear the participle in there. The implication of the participle is that saving is an ongoing activity. So it's not just Savior who has saved, but it's saving one, who God who always saves and continues to save and act on our behalf. Uh, finally here, uh, demonstrating uh, David's faith. Oh, well, there's two more things, excuse me. Uh, number four, take refuge. David's faith recognizes that God is the protector and he desires him to do so, uh, calling upon him uh, uh, to, that he might take refuge in him. And then finally, right hand. The right hand is the place of honor, but also the place of power. So he's appealing to God's right hand, both for love and power. We see that in a couple of places. Psalm 110, verse 1, which is, quoted by Jesus um, in Matthew to sort of um, flabbergast, I love that word, flabbergast the Pharisees, right? And this is the, the quote, the Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Uh, and so he, he uses that in Matthew, Jesus uses that in Matthew 10. But the point here and for our particular context is the Lord said to my, sit at my right hand, the right hand being the place of power. And then again from Ephesians 1, we get this wonderful uh, kind of ending to the second article of the uh, creeds, right? Where Jesus ascends to the right hand of God. Ephesians 1, he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority and power uh, and dominion and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. Notice that while this verse demonstrates David's faith, the emphasis is on the power and love of God. So Jesus is at the right hand of God, exercising both power far above all rule and dominion and authority. He has had power, but he also exercises love because you'll remember that one of the things Jesus does as our priest is he's an intercessor and seated at the right hand of God. He continually offers up and shows to God his sacrifice for the sins of all people. Uh, the sacrifice offered once and for all for all people. He intercedes for you. What is the danger of too strong a focus on our faith rather than on God's power and love? The danger, of course, is that uh, your faith, uh, at least probably as you experience it, feel it, varies. And, and it can be stronger and weaker on particular days. Um, if you have the challenge of a sick loved one, uh, your faith may may not quite be as strong as, as those moments when you're celebrating with family and loved ones on, on Easter morning, uh, the resurrection of the Lord, or on Christmas Eve, uh, the, the Savior has come. Um, your, your faith varies, right? Not that, not that it isn't saving at any point, but that as you feel it, as you experience it, you may feel closer and further from God. Now, you aren't really closer and further from God, but your feelings are that way. But relying on, upon our faith or focusing on our faith too much can make us very fickle and uncertain. If we focus only upon God's power and love, that is an accomplished act. God has sent his son to die for you. God has raised his son from the dead. God has shown his love for you and power for you in Jesus dying for your sins and rising to give you eternal life. It's an objective, accomplished act. And so when we hold fast to that, rather than so much focus upon our faith, uh, we're more steady because that never changes where our faith can, as I said earlier, be emotionally fickle. Okay. Verses eight and nine. You've heard this phrase before, the apple of your eye. Um, we, we hear people use that phrase all the time about their children or their grandchildren. They're the apple of your eye. Uh, the metaphor here may also be translated, interestingly, pupil of your eye or even the daughter of the eye. Uh, the implication remains the same, though, that the metaphor is that of something very, very precious. Uh, keeping your focus upon this, all right? The pupil of the eye or the daughter of my eye, keeping your focus upon this thing that you love. The same metaphor is used also of Israel in Deuteronomy 32, verse 10, and of the Torah in Proverbs 7, verse 2. These two metaphors found here in verses 8 and 9, um, excuse me, in verse 8, 
are also found together in the Song of Moses in Deuteronomy 32, verses 10 through 11. And David was probably very familiar with this song, right? As it's part of the Torah. Uh, it goes like this. In a desert land he found him, in a barren and hollowing waste. He shielded him and cared for him. He guarded him as the apple of his eye, like an eagle that stirs up its nest and hovers over its young, that spreads its wings to catch them and carries them aloft. Well, do you and I have similar metaphors we use for those things which are most precious to us? Uh, certainly, apple of the eye is one that people often use. Do you have other ones? Uh, I was having a hard time this morning thinking about the ones that I personally use. Uh, I have nicknames for, for my loved ones, and I use those, and it endears them to me. Um, and um, But I was ha having a hard time coming up with other metaphors. So I would love if you think of other metaphors of, of something that's that's very precious, that's a common metaphor we use today. You can e email those to me at pastor at sanjoselutheran.org. I'd love to hear them. So. Let's go on then to the next section of the psalm. And this again is uh, God's, uh, excuse me, David's prayer for God's deliverance from his enemies, verses 10 through 14. So he's moved from uh, the first five verses he was praying for vindication. Look, here's my case. Here's why I should be heard. Then he's now in the last uh, little bit uh, asked for God's intervention to act wondrously and to save and to give him refuge and all these things and to continue saving. Remember that ongoing participle idea. And now he's moving on and asking for final deliverance from his enemies. Verse 10. This verse would literally be translated, they close up their own fat. It's not what it looks like in English, right? It's something like the unfulfilled heart or the, the um, yeah, the unfulfilled heart. In ancient times, fat was a symbol of stupidity or rebellion. And you can look at Job 15, 27 and Psalm 1, 19, 70 if you want to look up more of that. The implication of this verse is essentially this, mm -hmm. that they have acted in rebellion and stupidity because of their arrogance and pride. So whether it's the unfulfilled heart, and let me make sure I've got that right. Uh, they have closed their unfeeling heart, unfeeling heart. Uh, the idea is just that they're acting stupidly or in rebellion against God and not appropriately. Verses 11 and 12. Here we perhaps see a clue to the historical setting of the psalm. Remember we talked about Saul's pursuit and attempted surrounding of David from 1 Samuel 23. One, most notably, the, the Hebrew word for circled or surrounded here is repeated. It's it's absaba, absaba. And so there's this repeat of the Hebrew word in the text there. And it would read, they have encircled and encircled our steps. So uh, remember that repetition serves as an emphasizer in the Hebrew. So the idea being that David's completely surrounded. Um, additionally, the ravenous intent of the enemies is displayed by the similes of the lion and the young lion, that they would tear them apart, that they would hide and lurking and wait to pounce upon them, uh, being the idea. But again, as I said at the introduction to this psalm, um, the historical setting may be David being pursued by Saul, but there's no way to uh, pinpoint it exactly. Simply, there isn't enough offered in the psalm to say that that's exactly what's happening. But it's, it fits, right? Verses 13 and 14, once again, the call for God to rise up. We have seen this in Psalms 9 and 10 and in Numbers 10.35. You might recall that in Numbers 10.35, as the Ark of the Covenant went before God's people, he thwarted their enemies. And so that's really the call of David in these Psalms 9, 10, and now here in 17. Arise, O Lord, and go before us, just like the Ark went before them in Numbers 10, and thwart my enemies. Verse 14 presents further David's assessment of those who pursue him. They are men of the world, men of this life. Men who store up treasures for themselves and for their children. The implication is that the focus of the enemies is so much on the life that is now that they have not the faith for the life to come. Is there anything wrong with storing up wealth for your children? Well, of course not. Of course not. But I ask the next question pretty deliberately. At what point does savings cross the line into greed or even a lack of faith in God as the provider? Now, before you answer that, I'd like you to hear this passage from Matthew 6, part of the Sermon on the Mount uh, and Jesus uh, preaching there. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow. They do not labor or spin. 
Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. What does Jesus teach us about worrying about storing up for tomorrow? Uh, there certainly needs to be a thought process of trusting in God to be the provider. Um, and Jesus holds out a couple of examples here, right? The birds of the air, they do not store in barns. They don't put things away forever, and yet God feeds them. Or the lilies of the field, they don't need to worry about what they're going to wear. God clothes them with beauty, and so God will clothe us. Uh, I, I certainly think we need to be cognizant um, of these things. What is the danger of worrying about these things? It's not trusting that God will take care of you and will provide for you. Now, I don't want you to walk away from this th uh, thinking that pastor is saying savings accounts or IRAs or 401k or whatever they are, right? Your, your saving devices are wrong. They're not. These are means by which God has provided to take care of us in our retirement and to take care of our children. Uh, life insurance also falls into that category. But what I would say to you is it's very easy uh, to fall into the reliability upon the means rather than the provider. What I mean is that it's very easy to become so reliant upon these things that we um, fail to trust in God to provide. Uh, I just want you to be cognizant and aware of those things. Uh, think about those things and pray about those things. Uh, you recall uh, the, the parable of the man who had this bumper crop and he said, what should I do? And so he builds a bigger and better barn saying, I, then I can eat, drink and take it easy for all of all this stored up. And of course, that night his life was demanded of him and God calls him, you fool, you fool, this life will be demanded. Of you. So don't think so much about uh, what you will store up for the future, uh, but uh, trust that God will provide. Uh, and use the mechanisms he's given you with insurance and retirement plans and all these things, but also uh, recognize that, that God is the continual provider for all of us. All right. Well, let's go to the last section, um, and it's the final section of the psalm. It's God's, the prayer of assurance that David offers. Verse 15. The assurance given in verse 15 is, 15 is the assurance of eternal life. When David wakes, he will see the face or likeness of God, David may have in mind here what the Lord had said of Moses to Aaron and Miriam in Numbers 13, verse 8. The greatest joy of heaven is to be in the presence of the Lord face to face. Uh, by the way, that, that uh, passage there from uh, Numbers 13, verse 8, I didn't recite it and I don't have it opened here. But it's God asking Moses and Miriam and Aaron to come out of the tent. And then he addresses Aaron and Miriam and, look, and says, look, you need to listen to Moses. I've allowed this guy to see me face to face. I've allowed him to see my likeness, right? And there's a connection to Psalm 17. Job also expresses the same sentiment and in doing so gives us the text of one of the greatest Easter hymns of all time. And you'll recognize these words from Job 19. I know that my Redeemer lives and that in the end he will stand on the earth. After my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh I will see God. I myself will see him with my own eyes, I and not another, how my heart yearns within me. Such is the joy of that hymn and the hope that it offers to us. One particular stanza sums up the idea both of Job 19 and also of Psalm 17 very well. And, and I can't really say it, so I'm going to sing it. And I apologize if it's, if it's not pleasant to your ears, all right? He lives and grants me daily bread. He lives and I shall conquer death. He lives my mansion to prepare. He lives to bring me safely there. Psalm 15 is a psalm of righteousness. Righteous David calling for deliverance from his enemies. Yet in the end, and even if such earthly deliverance should not come, David is delivered through eternal life. And so are we. 
God has granted us daily breath. God will give us conquering over death. Let us close again with the prayer from uh, Luther's readings in the, in the Psalms. Lord Jesus, true shepherd and defender of your people, grant us wisdom, strength, and patience. Wisdom to know and walk in the way everlasting. Strength to resist all temptations of error and sin, and to boldly confess your truth before men. Patience to bear the cross without murmuring, and gladly to suffer with you, that we may also rule with you. In Jesus' name, amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen.